Hello, Podwalkers, and welcome to another episode of the Goblin Lore Podcast. Before we start tonight's episode, I want to give a little bit of a disclaimer. Today on the show, we are going to be discussing suicide. Uh, This is a very important topic and something that we believe not only should be talked about, but also that this cast is kind of set up in a way that we have been wanting to discuss it for a while. Um, I initially had this idea for this episode stemming back to Suicide Prevention Month, which is in September every year. But I do think that this is a topic of conversation that really should be frankly discussed and discussed openly when people are comfortable with it. That said, we know that this might be a topic that people do not want to engage in. And we want to thank you for listening this far. And we completely understand if people choose to not engage with this episode. As typical, we are going to look at magic lore for story inspiration. And then we're going to be discussing this as a real world topic. At the end of the episode, we'll be providing some resources. And we also have a special guest with us for this topic tonight. We have brought in another mental health professional that's going to be joining us. This episode is not us providing specific information or providing clinical advice. It is us discussing suicide as both a topic and really kind of dispelling some of the myths about it and kind of trying to break down some of the barriers of the stigma around this topic. Before we get in too deep, we're going to ask our guests and our co-hosts to answer an introductory question as is typical on here. And that question for today, because I want to start us off on the right note, is simply going to be, what is one piece of self-care that you have been using lately? So um, once again, I am Hobbs Q. I can be found on Twitter at Hobbs Q. And what I've been using, as some people may have seen if you're on the Twitters, is Gelygraphy, which is a group of us that have been posting a photo every day of the month um, that, that we have taken and edited or just something that has inspired us. Uh, this kind of came about because there's a smaller group of us that really have been trying to get more into this hobby, and it's been a hobby that's really important to me. Um, and I've had a backlog of just beautiful photos that I wanted to spend time with. And this month has given me really that push to do it. And it's been functioning as kind of a self-care for me. My name is Chase. Um, I am a master's of social work student currently. Um, I have my bachelor's in psychology um, and I'm on Twitter and my handles manicures. Um, as for self-care, I find that I have varying forms of self-care. Um, you know, magic for me has always been a very important form of self-care and I always have my days carved out for that. But lately I feel it's like very simple. It's, um, you know, whenever I'm feeling a little bit down or a little bit drained, I really like to go to, um, my local sheets and get like a gigantic soda. And I, I don't know, it's something about like the nice night drive and like driving there and getting my soda. I actually have one right here next to me. Um, <laughs> it's very soothing. Now I'm going to take a big sip I'm boring. I get a Coke Zero. <laughs> I'm like, mm, you know, when, when my cheat day comes up, I'll be getting a Baja Blast. But until then, I'm just going to live. In Coke I'm assuming you'll get that at Taco Bell. I was just going to say, this one's for you, Arctic Mebo. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> I'll be I Tokyo drifting there. <laughs> well, thank you, Chase, and welcome. We are glad to have you aboard. Yay, thank you. All right. Uh, I'm Alex Newman, found on Twitter at Alexander New M. Um, and one uh, piece of self-care that I've been, been using a lot lately, it's it's kind of a thing that's, I don't know, a work in progress that I'll probably always be tinkering with. Um, so I have some different playlists of music that I listen to, depending on various things that I'm trying to do with, with my own uh, mood and things going on in the day. And, and one of them that uh, I have, I could just call my mantra playlist. And it's it's every song on the list in the lyrics, either in theme or some of them, it's literally just one line or the chorus is a message that I sometimes need to hear. Um, so in a lot of ways, I, I think of this kind of like the, uh, the the sitcom tropes where, you know, the person has to record a video for themselves that they watch <laughs> in the future to tell themselves, okay, you don't need to do this or you should be doing this. or, And that's this is kind of my version of that. Alex, you were getting really good um, as this cast has been going on at self-promotion and promotion of our Patreon, because this (laughs) is the kind of content that you can find in our Discord channel, because we have a channel that's basically music suggestions, which is usually Alex talking about these amazing playlists. Yep. Love it. Yep. Finally curated uh, uh, inspirational music channel. It's pretty sweet. And Into the Spider-Verse soundtrack also. Of course. Right. Like I said, finally curated inspiration. (laughs) 
Uh, and I'm Joe Redman. You can find me on Twitter at Findhorn. That's F-Y-N-D Horn. And I guess the biggest piece of uh, self-care that I've done lately um, has just been to, like, sleep in. Like, you know, that's just been i i usually run every day on like six hours of sleep or so that's that's my usual is is like six hours and then i'm good to go but like i don't know i've just been needing it and i i picture you on only four hours of sleep oh it, yeah i i can i can and do uh insomnia is a wonderful thing but um yeah but this past week i've just been like i don't know just needed more time and i've decided to carve out a little more time for myself to not just either be puttering around on Twitter or playing video games. And I'm like, you know what? Or or cleaning, I guess. But I'm just saying, okay, you know, I am going to spoil myself and go to bed early. (laughs) Saying this is going to make me feel old, but I have to say um, learning how to take naps was like Mm. revelatory, especially during things like I'd go to cons and the first couple years was like, I need to make the most of all this stuff because like I I spent a long time avoiding conventions because of my social anxiety. And so when I finally am like, I'm going to get every moment of every day and and then I realized like being burned out and sitting in a panel doesn't really get me anything. But napping through like two hours where there's no programming I care about so that I can be awake and aware and there has been like really good for me. Mm-hmm. I feel that. I feel yeah. those feels. And the coffee just tastes so much better after a after a good <laughs> nap or a good long sleep. Oh. <sighs> it's less like you're not you're not just like chugging it down. You're just like, ooh, I can I can savor this and watch the sunrise <laughs> at are noon a, when I slept a, in. Are you a Folgers commercial? <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. Well, thank you, everyone, because as we're moving along and progressing through this episode, it is self-care is actually very, very important to this topic. And it's something that we're going to be kind of hitting on, especially with our first lore piece. So we actually have brought in a couple of lore storylines to discuss about here. The initial spark for this article or this episode (sighs) came from an article by our own Findhorn, Joe Redman, which is about Gideon's dealing with the guilt over his role in the death of the Irregulars. Uh, This is a topic that we discussed initially when it came to the trauma back in like episode two or three. And Joe, you wrote this article that can be found both, I believe on hipsters, but also on, our blog um, where this was posted. So I was hoping that you might be able to kind of start us off here because this really was what got me thinking about how we could approach this from a cast. Yeah. um, So this article piece actually was inspired by um, a a friend of the show, Michelle Rapp uh, at Balefire Strix on Twitter. And um, her article that she wrote for Card Kingdom a couple of years back on Gideon dealing with depression and uh, trauma specifically. Um, and so I sort of in in the first revelation of the War of the Spark cards and then eventually through reading the novel, um, just, you know, sort of had this realization that what Gideon, the sacrifice that Gideon made to give up his power um, to protect Liliana while altruistic and that's kind of the surface reading of it um really was kind of his way of committing suicide because it, throughout magic's story since Gideon was introduced we've seen him essentially try to run himself into the ground time and time again whether it's running up against a, an unstoppable opponent like Nicol Bolas whether it's, um, you know, just trying to exhaust himself to death by uh, planes walking between Zendikar, uh, currently under siege from the Eldrazi, or then under siege from the Eldrazi, and um, cleaning up Ravnica in the lead up to the return to Ravnica block. Um, just he was, he was running himself ragged and trying to find some sort of way to, I think, partially, I mean, obviously, partially atone for the um, death of his best friends, the Irregulars uh, on Theros, but also, uh, you know, he, he felt acutely this weight of caring for the multiverse on his shoulders. And because of his 
you know, specific magical power, which was invulnerability. Uh, he had never been able to actually be hurt. Uh, and so this, while it is a kind act, while it's a good act in, in some way, um, it's, I, I think in talking with Michelle actually too, and I, and I hope she doesn't mind that I'm sharing a little bit of this, you know, she'd said specifically that it did bother her because it seemed, it does read once you put that framework of he's giving up his power so that he can finally be done feeling all this pain and hurt and responsibility, um, that she was upset by it. She was angered by it because it's selfish. Um, and it, and it, and it hurts to take that, to take someone you care, who you know, for somebody that you care about to take themselves away from you. And, and that's sort of the same kind of impact. It's a diff, it's a different feel, but it's a similar sort of impact that this story made for me. Um, because it seems like throughout this course of Gideon's arc, he deals with what's called passive suicidal ideation, just this ongoing ever present idea in the back of your head that not that you are trying to die, but eh, man, it might be better than what's within what you're dealing with right now, whether it's emotionally, physically, whatever. And and I was wondering, I mean, I, th I think this might be an important time to, this is more of the real world topic, but I think it's going to be important to establish now that there is a difference when we talk about suicidal ideation between passive and active suicidal ideation. Yes. Yeah. Passive suicidal ideation, in my experience, has been where you, you, you aren't actively seeking to complete suicide, but the feeling of, you know, if I were to be hit by a car, or if someone was to shoot me, I would be okay with it. Whereas active suicidal, you know, ideation, you're having active thoughts, uh, you know, you have an intent, you may even have a plan in place uh, to complete suicide. Whereas that's uh, not the case with passive. So, th yeah, this is a distinction that we make that there is. Uh, and one thing that I want to get, get out of the way here right now is that thoughts about suicide are very common. Mm -hmm. Thoughts mm -hmm. about suicide have happened to probably most people at some point in their life, either active or passive. Um, mm -hmm. Thinking about suicide is not enough to get you hospitalized. Um, which is a concern for a lot of people. And part of it is we do try as professionals are making a distinction between, as Chase just said, not only are there thoughts present, passive or active, but intent and plan. So Joe, you're kind of talking about from this story, it's this approaching it from this article that you had read too about what passive suicidal ideation looks like and feels like, because a lot of people don't, really have the language for understanding the difference or knowing that there is a difference. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and I think that's a, an important thing too, is, is, you know, that is the distinction that you draw there is, is important because Gideon doesn't plan this final act of his life. It just comes upon him. And I think, I do think he seizes on that opportunity to finally, um, release himself from from the hurt that he's feeling um but you know that is that is the distinction is he is never he's never planned it he's never he's thought about what it, again like you said chase what it would be like you know it you know it wouldn't be that bad there are a couple of quotes that gideon says or um you know moments from the lore over the last couple of arcs that uh that i do think really hammer this home um one of them is this is the the real big one when he confronts Nicol Bolas right at the end of uh, before he planes walks away. Um, Bolas says, "I could kill you, Gideon, any time I want, but I suspect you would not mind dying. Stay and die, or leave and live. I'm content either way." And it, the next paragraph is Gideon was shocked to realize that a part of him yearned to stay, and. It, uh, you know, going on, this would be your, your, your four dot ellipsis. Uh, he didn't want any more death on his hands. He could just let go. And so, um, you know, that's, that's kind of the, the tough thing to have to reckon with in, in Gideon's story is, you know, even from the moment that we first meet him as Gideon Jura, um, 
you know, dealing in the middle of in the middle of Rise of the Eldrazi and Zendikar. He's he's like working himself to the bone because of this pain, this hurt that is there in his mind and in his heart. Um, and and it's all of these. It it culminates in these thoughts of, but what if I just didn't not what if I didn't have to feel like this anymore, but what if I didn't have to feel? And that's uh, the sad yeah, part of but it. Yeah, but I've, I've worked with people that talk about the idea that when they get to that point, they may actually put themselves into dangerous situations, not, once again, hoping that even, not even hoping that something will happen to them, but not caring if something will happen to them, and so may put themselves into risky situations or think about that idea that, well, somebody else is more important than me. So I would do something if, you know, if I had the chance, um, sort of reckless heroics almost. Yeah. Yeah. And I, so this is a time, you know, we talked about, we've talked about our own struggles on here and my struggles with depression. And I've never been anybody that really has had active suicidal ideation, but I definitely have had the death fantasies and the, you know, if I were to die, who would come to my funeral or, you know, what if I just turn this car into the wall beside me, you know, not ever a plan, not ever intent, but the what if, and the, just the tiredness of wanting to not deal with depression. And it would be better to not wake up, which is what I kind of think of when I think of that passive kind of ideation. Yeah. Right. Um, I myself have had instances where I've had sort of thoughts and feelings, intrusive thoughts where I've been, you know, like, what if this happened or what if this happened? I, I mean, we, these thoughts are, are, are common and, you know, shouldn't, no one should ever feel ashamed of having these thoughts. Um, right. But I've worked with clients as well who have told me similar instances of like passive uh, suicidal ideation, uh, whether it be, you know, like, you know, like, you know, what if I like just act just like veered off the road or, what if I, um, you know, like if somebody pulled a gun on me, you know, you know, I would just, I would just take you know, stuff like that. And I feel like in this instance, I, it's just kind of similar to kind of look at it from the point of view in the Gideon story as well. How in that moment, even though he was thinking there was a part of him that wanted to stay, he still had that moment of I could just, just let it be. He, he, the removal of choice altogether of I just going to let what happened. Right. Yeah. And it even, that passage even does say too, that um, in the end it was the dragon's indifference that made his decision for him. He didn't, he didn't decide, you know, he, he willingly accepted that, well, I'm, I'm going to just react to Bolus's arrogance and, and that will make my decision. But, you know, he didn't say, he didn't take that stand and say, yeah, I, I want to you know yeah. survive yeah are yeah. you calling bolus a good guy in this situation uh i guess in okay. this small moment oh. <laughs> i'm just checking just confirming i think he did go to med school i mean his original art he's just sitting there learning he's reading he looked old and he looked tired so you could tell he was in graduate school how do we not how have we not had chase on the show before now <laughs> friend of the cast oh boy so Bye. Blue, Joe, is, is already... Blue is in the Grixis wedge. So it... something that we will get into more in the real world application part, but I, I do want to button hook the Gideon story with this is, is Gideon has been presented in our stories quite frequently. And again, I, like I say, the surface reading of this story of this final story for him can be that he made a noble sacrifice and in, you know, um, in, in his final act. And, and I think he did in some respects. However, the decisions and choices that he made, the emotional state that led him to that act is not something that, you know, it, it's not something that is a, a model for how to handle um, suicidal ideation of any kind, you know, whether, whether it's passive or active, it's something that, you know, yes, we see we see some of the good effects in the story, but we also don't forget that just because we didn't see Gideon's funeral on a card, that that part is that that part gets forgotten. You know what I mean? That that this is this is an a, it's a compelling story because it gives you both the 
the upside of what he did to sacrifice him or what his sacrifice meant, but also, you know, there's, there's a cost and a weight and, and there's a pain even when these people go. And so we do want, I do desperately want to urge anyone who deals with any of this stuff and myself included, you can read that in the article in more detail, but we have a lot of, um, resources for dealing with suicidal ideation or, um, suicidal attempts, that sort of thing. And all of those will be linked in these show notes as well. So. So part of this pulling this episode together, I actually was wondering because when we had talked before, I, I had, I did not know really well in the lore how much suicidal ideation or even representation of suicide has been handled in the story. So I did reach out to Borthos Twitter to kind of ask about this. Um, what is interesting is I was linked to two articles uh, at least. So I was a link to an article about Daragaz. Um, and so these are the next two that we're really going to handle. And one that was about Chandra Nalar that is actually from not too long ago. It was actually from Kaladesh block. Um, and they actually included a content warning on there. And I think in part wizards recognize that this was not a topic that is discussed mm -hmm. or is dealt with in magic lore. And so I think that it's because it's it's a question of how do you handle this in our fantasy game? I mean, is this something that I think there are, in society in general, there is a shying away from talking about this. But uh, Dergaz's story, that isn't really talked about there or isn't really talked on that level. Mm -hmm. um, so Dergaz was a, a legendary dragon from the invasion cycle. Um, he, in the lore, goes back even further. He was helping out Urza with... Um, the the Shiv Manor rig with the Viashano and the dragons. Uh, apparently, Dergaz helped evacuate Sarah's realm, so he was involved with Urza early on and in these plans to help save Dominaria from the Phyrexian invasion. And then, when the Phyrexians actually invaded, he took a front line. He was working actively working against the Phyrexians um, until he was contacted by the Planeswalker Tevish Zat who told him about the, the legend of these prim of all dragons um, and showed him a, the, the, the red dragon who was dead in Shiv um, and told him how to free these others. So he went, uh, Daragaz went and freed Rith and they freed Treva um, and Croesus and, and um, through this whole story, they becoming the, the, they're becoming more and more powerful and um, the dragons are kind of, as they're becoming more powerful, more immortal, um, they're pulling Daragaz along with them, and uh, they had mortal dragons, and they were just sacrificing them along the way, and this was upsetting him. Like, these are his people. These were people he was supposed to protect. Um, but then, by the end, when they're going to free Croesus, the last, um, the, the fourth, they um, are able, they, they take his will from him, it, well, is in, in this description. It's been a while since I've read the story, but it says, um, Dergas found that his mind was no longer his own, and all he could think of was freeing the last Primaval and was willing to sacrifice as many mortal dragons as necessary. So they get there, and they free this dragon, and the five of them now, the full complement of these, these dragon gods, come out in their full power, and the first thing they do is they attack the thing that is challenging their dominance during the invasion cycle, the weather light because it's in the skies and that is where our heroes for the story are mm -hmm. um and during this fight um uh, dergaz latches onto the ship and um trying to rip out the engines however karn touched his mind and brought him back to his senses and just reading the the mtg wiki thing um it says dergaz was horrified at what he had become and so chose to throw himself into a volcano to break the pantheon of the gods and weaken the others so that they could be slain um, now this is just a summary because we're looking at the wiki and it's, these events are in the invasion books. I, I remember that much, but it was a long time ago that I read them was in high school. And so I don't remember how much it went into that, but I'm pretty sure that was a very quick decision. And he chose the heroic death, which is a very common fantasy trope. And, and, and I was going to say, Alex, the invasion blog gave us a couple of these kind of, I think, more fantasy tropes for how suicide may be handled mm -hmm. because we also get Baron. Yes. Who, who basically, you know, uh, the flavor text and where this is most poignant is on the card obliterate. Um, mm -hmm. 
Baron basically returns to the plane to mourn his daughter who has been killed and his wife. And yeah. in this grief, he uses a basically like a spell he promised he would never use. And it says for his family, Baron made a funeral pyre of Teleria. He basically, it's, it's this grief that is so stricken that he basically burns down a plane, including himself because there's no regard for him. And I think that, in some ways, this is kind of how the idea of suicide has been handled more in fantasy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and framed often in the the heroic sacrifice. So that one, I remember them framing it not quite that way. That was more his mourning, mourning, and, but yes, and it was yeah. you know he was taking out Phyrexians, but he was also killing other people. And like this, I I don't think they really juxtaposed these two, but in a lot of ways, it was like, well, this is the right way to heroic sacrifice. This is the wrong way. Yeah, um, but. And this is really just weird timing of things. Um, I've recently been listening to the Encrypted series by Shauna McGuire. It's an urban fantasy series. And in the most recent novel, like literally listening to, I've been listening to it over the last two or three days, um, there's some characters to have a conversation about this, the, the heroic sacrifice, a little bit. They don't go super deep into it, but they talk a little bit about this because um, the main character of this of this book runs into someone who who has is trying to challenge some great power because a friend of his um, went to this power to make a bargain for him Jane, uh, and his friend is gone. She's disappeared and he, is no, he, is, he hasn't seen her for years. And so he has decided he is going to take on this great force. And while he's talking about it, um, he, he mentions just in passing during his plan that he's like, you know, but if it takes my life, I'm going to do it. Uh, to which the main character, or you know, here's the sorry, here's the quote: "I'd rather not die if I don't have to, not unless it's the only way to bring her back." To which the main character responds, "Noble, but I promise you, she wouldn't be amused if you died to get her out of magical mystery jail." <laughs> and then and they go back and forth. It's like, well, "You've never met her. How would you know?" And and this line, because while I've never met her, I've been socially isolated. And I've had socially isolated friends. And none of, us, none of us have ever said, you know what? I'd be cool if you died for me when you absolutely didn't have to. We don't work that way. By which I mean friends don't work that way. Yeah. I feel like when we're looking at a lot of, of, of the characters that we're going to be, we've talked about and that we're going to talk about, I feel like it's kind of nice to see the, the shift that Wizards is taking with the handling of the topic of of self-sacrifice and suicide and sort of the, the heroic sacrifice that we've been talking about. How with, um, you know, the story that we talked about, Dara guys, we don't really see any mention of, you know, like, hey, that this is, you know, something that is um, thoughts and feelings, you know, like the sacrifice, suicide, death, and so on and so forth. Whereas with the Chandra story that we'll be getting into, I feel like, I think it was a fantastic that they put a, a warning um, on, on that story. Because I feel like warnings, I know that a lot of people today make fun of them, you know, with the whole like, trigger warning joke. But triggers can be incredibly impactful um, to people for a number of different reasons that, you know, are very personal. And I feel like the shift from, you know, even though, hey, this is a heroic thing that they're doing, it's not something to be mimicked um, or implemented by yourself. You know, um, it's something that they say, hey, this is a serious topic. We're going to let you know that we're going to be talking about this. And I think like even like at the beginning of the podcast, you know, this is an important topic that we feel like we need to discuss, but it can be difficult for some. I think it's important to uh, have, you know, and the fact that Wizards is doing that just makes me very happy. Yeah. And and we see, I think um, we're going to move in a little bit just to kind of end our lore piece to talking about Chandra. Um and this is the Chandra story called Burn, um, which was featured on the mothership. And that was back in 2017. And this is kind of, it gives you, it's, it's, it was when they had the story going on and we, we jump into basically, this is Tezzeret trying to get the Aether Hub working and get the Aether Hub basically we know now from his machinations with Polis. But we basically have Pia and Chandra Nilar um, confronting Dovin Bond. And this story has been now that the point where we got to come back, we see that Chandra's mother is alive, who Chandra had believed dead for many years and felt responsible for. Um, and 
we see there kind of this confrontation between them. And Chase, if you want to take part of the story, I'd be more than happy to let you. Are you just throwing it over to her because she's the guest redhead on the podcast? Is that it? Better representations for redheads and magic. It's just like <laughs> goblins. We all need better representation. They're everywhere, all over the place. <laughs> I love, I loved this story when I read it. Um, mostly because I wanted to, I'm just, I'm just a connections person. So I'm so sorry. <laughs> I, um, when I was reading this, I thought there was a lot of connections to the story with Gideon. Mainly, I, stories, I mean, for plot, for plot reasons, pretty much what's going on is Chandra is attempting to make this big sacrifice to just, just end it all in this way where she's just, you know, absolutely building up and building up and building up and building up and she's about to let loose but Nissa she just kind of like clings to her and she's like if you are going to take yourself out you're going to take me out and that kind of you know that kind of knocks Chandra back but one of the things that I thought was so impactful about this story that connects with Gideon that connects with us as real people is the fact that in her mind she's having all these like thoughts you have Baral saying all these hateful, spiteful things to her, and that's just feeding into her rage and her feeling of self-loathing and frustration and her anger. And I feel like that kind of mirrors in with what was happening with Gideon, where Nicol Bowles was just like, I don't care. And he was having all these, you know, thoughts where Erebos was talking to him and how he could just sort of just set free. And I feel like those are representative of the thoughts that sometimes we have where it's not necessarily, you know, the, not necessarily us speaking to us in a kind way, where we sometimes, you know, say, you know, you're not good enough, you're horrible, you do these bad things, you're a terrible person, you're never going to be this good, compare yourself to others. And I feel like that, you know, all the things that she was saying, like, it doesn't matter, you don't matter, where Brawl was even speaking to her and saying, you're a monster, you know, you killed all these people, you know, you, it's your fault that your father died. These things kind of mirror reality in a way where I feel like we ourselves may not necessarily be the kindest to ourselves. And so, I feel like that is, is a lot. Yeah, that's a really good point. I I think that's a, a really good thing to, to draw out. I, I, you know, yeah, it is that, that moment of, of, you know, Baral and Erebos and all of that take on our, our inner voices. And that's... Um, I mean, Hobbs, you got some really good moments, really good quotes in, in our notes here that are, I think, really exemplary of that. Yeah, so I, I actually pulled these quotes out because to me, at least from what I found, this is the kind of the closest that we have seen to what I would say is almost active suicidal ideation. Mm -hmm. um, we have at one point Chandra basically having this conversation um, where she it has the self-sacrifice but it is not in the same way as we've seen it before because it has these thoughts as you guys are saying that she mirrors what people are saying in the story is almost the self-talk that chandra is having in her head she says i can make amends for mrs pashiri for dad for mom for the old women and little kids i killed in the sanctum of the stars for a lifetime of screwing up all the awful things i've done all the people i failed the air between my hands is packed with stars vibrating, superheated, streaks of light scratched through my vision. There's something I can always do. And to me, this is really, we're going to get into this, but what she is talking about here is doing, and th there is a big shift here. Now she says, I could take out Brawl. I could take out the ships and the gear hulks, Tezzeret and the consoles. I could take out all of Girapur if I want. It's so easy. I just have to bottle it up and release. I just have to let go. Because it doesn't matter anymore, does it? Everything is ruined. Let it go. Close your eyes. Let it happen. Let it be over. Doesn't matter. I close my aching eyes on Kaladesh and whisper, I can burn. So, yes, there is this element that has that she would be doing it for a purpose, which I understand for fantasy as a trope and for stories is important. But this is the first time that we are talking about she is doing it. And there is a discussion of the doing it. And the self-talk that is behind it is very much the cognitions of I am a failure. I've let people yeah. down. It's easy. There's something I can do. It's for a lifetime of screwing up. I mean, this is the extreme thoughts 
that I have often heard from people who are suicidal. Well, and, and even, yeah, the ex- there's the extreme thoughts, but it all does boil down to that one tiny pinprick of, but there's this one thing I can control. And that's that's something that I think any of us who've had thoughts like this, we've we've clung to that thing. We've tried to find that one thing that it's like, okay, I can't, I mean, all of us in life, we want some element of control over our situations or our environment or something. Like we want to know that we are able to influence the world and, and matter. Um, and so when, ev- when it feels like everything, when it feels like everything's ruined, like what Chandra's saying to herself, you look to that one thing I can burn. And that's, you know, that, that does ring really true to me. And um, sorry. No, sorry. <laughs> Um, When I was reading it, the one line that stuck out to me particularly was, um, it's so easy. Um, Mm -hmm. And that's something I've also heard from clients. And and, and it's the thoughts that I've had myself at times. You know, it's so easy. You know, it's just, it's right there. It's it's ahead of you. Sort of that self-talking into it. She herself is, she's a weapon herself. And Mm -hmm. she she may not have had a plan, but she, she herself She's the means to complete. Mm-hmm. And so I do yeah. think that that is the shift from passive to active is because all she has to do is just be herself and then it it's over. And I feel like that's something that all should be taken into account. The fact that she herself was like, it's easy. I can do this. It's all I know how to do. And the other quote that I kind of put in here just to end for towards the end of the story, she's actually – is being comforted by the members of the gate watch that are around her. And she is saying, she says, damn it. She says through gritted teeth. I can't even, I just, I want to leave. I shouldn't be here. I don't deserve. There almost is now a sense of guilt because she did not do it. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And And it it again is, it's that sort of thing of like, I, I failed even at this sort of thing. You know, Mm -hmm. that's something I talk about in the article that I wrote is, um, the times there, the times that I have strayed from passive into near active, uh, ideation, mm-hmm. um, the thing that stopped me from actually trying to, uh, attempt suicide, um, was the fact that I'm really terrified of pain. Like I'm really terrified of hurting myself or of doing something to um possibly like you know just just not not do it right i guess is is the way to say it and um and that that would be worse than not having done it at all and so then that's what stops me and so then that feeling afterwards for me has been well shoot you couldn't even do that right you know mm-hmm. and, and so that does have that build up effect uh, you know Again, can that that's something that rings really true, and it's something that I think the author did a really great job of representing in that story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I don't I have anything to contribute to Chandra, so if you don't mind me throwing out another just sort of narrative story mm. thing. So I, I realized because I mentioned that this is the the heroic sacrifice is a very common uh, fantasy trope, but I don't I didn't continue my my thought there in that i don't think it's often handled very well mm-hmm. because it is it isn't it isn't shown in its completion it's put on a pedestal as well this is the most heroic thing and but you don't see the consequences you don't see the people left behind often you don't see all of these other aspects and all the other things that are going on and and i think that's why it's so important to talk about it and that's why i'm glad we're doing this this cast and everyone's here to to have this conversation yeah. Yeah. Which is a really nice segue, which is not typical for us, <laughs> into kind of our, our, our real world correlate. I mean, our natural world connection here is obviously suicide. Um, yeah. But I wanted to use this as an opportunity for us to kind of talk about maybe a little bit from the perspective of people who are in, in the field, especially Chase and I, about facts about suicide maybe some common myths about it um so um, i have some that i want to hit on but chase is there anything that you really you know you want to make sure that we do discuss um 
I mean, just with the topic that we've been having, I feel like what we've been saying with, um, you know, passive and active, I think that distinction is important to make, or as we already have made. I also think that it's important that we talk about the fact that, um, you know, these thoughts aren't horrible to have and they're not bad to have these thoughts and have these feelings. There have been times where, you know, I've had these thoughts where I'm pretty sure everyone here, as you have stated, have had these thoughts. You should not feel ashamed to have them or, or seek out help. And I just, I know that we've already said that, but that just always rings true to me when we talk about this topic is that it's, you're important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. It, it's, it's a sentiment that needs repeating for sure. Yep. And I do think that there is a very real fear. Um, what is interesting about this is people are afraid of talking about it. And what's interesting is people are afraid of talking about it when they actually are thinking of wanting to die. Um, mm -hmm. Part of what they're afraid of talking about it, though, is that they're going to be forcefully hospitalized just for mentioning it. Yeah. And there are horror stories of people that got placed on hold by overeager staff. Ideally, that is not the situation. You know, um, I have people that I work with on a daily basis that are chronically suicidal, mm -hmm. that have had these thoughts for 30, 40 years. And some have never had an attempt, but they have the thoughts and the thoughts yeah. are there. I feel like one thing that I think about is the fact, and this is something that makes me fearful when, when talking about suicidal ideation, whether it be passive or active, is that um, certain forms of media tend to sort of romanticize, if not glorify, um, suicide. And that is something that has made me nervous, um, especially when I was an undergrad and, you know, like 13 Reasons Why I came out. That was something uh, for, for me because you could sort of see the spike in this in this mimicry because it was sort of this beautiful, tragic tale of this girl who is is dead. And, you know, she was beautiful and all these things happened to her. And it's like this revenge story. But. It even regardless of the fact that they had trigger warnings and they had hotline information, it was a story that was and continues to because they are making it another season romanticize and make suicide seem to be this very beautiful thing. And in when we're talking about it in the face of magic, that is also something that makes me nervous with the sacrifice uh, Daragaz and Gideon made to the almost sacrifice Chandra made, the sort of glorifying like you know, martyrdom that would somehow send the wrong signal to people. And while it's not bad to have these thoughts, acting on them, I it just, it makes me sad to see it romanticized in media. And so that's why I'm glad we're talking about it because it, it is not something that should be glorified uh, like certain media outlets have made it to be. Yeah. I mean, that's they've a, that's made... Good... Sorry, can I jump in on that really quick? Um, and I, that's a, I think that's a really good thing to... Um state clearly too because i i've i've had conversations with people also about the artwork uh for um heartwarming redemption which was in war of the spark um and that's the the feature art on the article that i wrote if anyone's interested uh in looking at it it's um it shows gideon basically in um like the the magic version of the Elysian fields, sort of the Greek uh, afterlife, uh, the Greek heaven. Um, and he's surrounded by the irregulars, his friends. Um, who have not aged. Who have not aged at all. And, and yeah, they're, they're warm, you know, greeting him warmly and forgiving him and all this sort of stuff. Um, and, you know, like you were saying, Chase, you know, some people that I've, I've talked to had said like, yeah, that's, but you know he he did something that's not really that we don't want to see glorified that we don't want to see in in that positive of a light he gets essentially he gets rewarded for doing this sort of thing and that's not a, that's not really the moral you want to take away from that and and while i think it's beautiful artwork you know yeah i can see that point for sure well i mean the the card title alone is heartwarming redemption the flavor text is Kytheon had known war every day of his life. Now he finally knows peace. Mm -hmm. It reads like a eulogy. Yeah. 
Right. Yeah. And um, with 13 Reasons Why, I was wondering if that's where you were kind of going when you started, because they've actually made this decision to cut the graphic scene of suicide that they had chosen to include in the season one. Mm -hmm. This was something that's been asked for by researchers in the field since yeah. the episode aired. Hmm. We're now getting ready to enter. They're doing the third season of this show, basically. Really? Yeah. And they're concerned about the fact that they're, it almost gave a message of somebody who was bullied committed a school shooting. If only you had been friends with him, you know, it's, yeah. it's, 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 There's it a is lot risky. Of problems. Yeah. Yeah. And it, yeah. I mean, as someone who, when it first came out, I watched it and I know this is kind of moving away from the topic of, of, of sort of the lore of it. When I watched that episode, I remember when it came out, I was um, sitting on my couch in my dorm room. Uh, my roommates weren't home and people all over Tumblr, I mean, just everywhere, plastering it over. There should be trigger warnings on this episode. It's horrible. All these things happen. And I was like, what are they going to show? You know, it's TV. I watched that episode and it was, um, mm -hmm. it was, it was a lot. Um, mostly because that um the this the the suicide scene that which they showed was um typically a way to sort of successfully complete suicide they showed it in well, a way that if someone were to yes. make it it would be successful mm -hmm. and that was something to me that shocked me that, that this is a show in high school for teenagers i mean when i was a teenager i thought i knew everything and you know i was this mature adult individual but I was impressionable and to see that is so impactful the fact that they showed a way that could successfully complete suicide in a graphic way they don't pan away you don't hear stuff you see it mm -hmm. and that was something to that just shocked me to my core that they would show you that in, in, in a way that like i said we won't get into details but mm -hmm. in a way that is counter to what most people think of which would be completely successful in the way it's done in the show, which is not how most people would think of it. Yes. Know, if they did not see that. And that, that was yeah. a concern from researchers from day one. And this is where we get into what society knows and talks about. I mean, there is a discussion to be had for the fact that they're talking about suicide. Um, for a lot of time, suicide has been a taboo subject. The idea of a content warning or a trigger warning is not necessarily, and even when it started out, was not so that people didn't have discussions. It was to make people aware that this was going to be discussed. Mm -hmm. be because this idea that in the, early on when they were being used as this joke of like, haha, it's going to trigger somebody, the reason researchers didn't necessarily like it or didn't want them is because a lot of mental health is about avoidance. And completely avoiding ever thinking about negative things doesn't mean that you're not going to have negative things, but it means that you're not going to talk about them or that you may not be willing to engage with them. The idea behind them really is that you have a choice of how you are engaging with them. That's why we preface the show with that. We're not shying away from this discussion. We're acknowledging though, that some people might not be at the point where they want to engage. But even as somebody who, has had a few internships, who has interacted with clients who have had these sort of thoughts and feelings, I still get extremely nervous, you know, mm -hmm. anxious. You know, I get, I feel like, you know, like I shouldn't be talking about this. You know, I'm saying the wrong things. And it just, it, I mean, like I even have uh, chatted to you guys multiple times. Oh God, I'm nervous <laughs> because this is a topic that is just so, it's just, it has this negative association. It's very stigmatized. Um, in, in, in any sort of outlet. That's our show. You can find the podcast at Goblin Lore Pod on Twitter or email any questions, comments, or concerns to goblinlorepodcast at gmail.com. If you would like to support the friendly neighborhood gobslugs, you can do so at patreon.com slash goblinlorepod. This episode of Goblin Lore was hosted by Hobbs Q, who you can find on Twitter at Hobbs Q. This episode was written and co-hosted by Alex Newman, who you can find on Twitter at Alexander New M. Engineering, editing, and production for this episode by Joe Redeman, who you can find on Twitter at Findhorn. That's F-Y-N-D Horn. Our music is by Wintergatten, who you can find at Wintergatten.com. That's winter G-A-T-A-N.com. 
logo by Stephen Raphael on Twitter at Stephen Raffle. Goblin Lore is a presentation of Hipsters of the Coast, which you can find at hipstersofthecoast.com or at hipstersmtg on Twitter. Thank you all for listening. And remember, goblins, like snowflakes, are only dangerous in numbers.